my job as a sound designer really is to to um, to help tell the story as best as I can. And the device I use is sound in the same way as a lighting designer will use a device which is lighting. A set designer will use the device which is set, costumes, etc., etc. We all use devices to tell the story. My device is sound. And I will use the music and the sound effects to do that. Um, and I will use anything to help tell the audience, or to explain to the audience where we are, what time of day it is, what the mood is, what's going on outside, which is crucially very important, so that you don't just understand what's going on on stage, you also understand what's going on off stage. The world outside is very important. Um, if you're doing a play and there is no music playing, you can just do sound effects whenever you like them, or rather, if appropriate, but you don't have to match them to the, to the orchestration or to the, to the music. In this case, because it's pit, there's a lot of pitch going on, um, I've had to pitch a lot of the sound effects to the music so that there is a tonality um, coherence, as it were, so that the pitch of the music resembles the pitch of the sound effects. So if there's a, an airplane drone, it's not just it's not, it doesn't sound like the, the, the airplane is off tune. However, we don't want to make it too close to the music because it isn't music, it needs to be a sound effect. So the, the trick has been to kind of make it, so to, to make it match the music tonality-wise and texture-wise and pitch-wise, but still make it sound like a sound effect. So that it, it doesn't sound like the music and people go, that's a plane and therefore there's a plane flying over. That's a bomb and therefore there's a bomb outside. That's a car and therefore there's traffic outside. We decided to, to, to exploit the idea of surround sound um, because we felt that, uh, that this particular score is so cinematic that it was screaming out for, I guess, a, um, uh, a cinematic style of treatment. Um, and I guess that's across the board, but in my case that meant um, uh, enveloping the audience with sound, immersing them in sound. There was an issue with, um, it, people tend to talk about cinema sounds, surround sound, they, they kind of know about that, not necessarily technically, but they understand what that means. Um, there's a problem with that because with cinema sound you have to have one very large, 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 large loudspeaker in the middle of the stage. Of course you can't have that in, uh, in theatre because you can't do that. It's hidden behind the screen in the cinema. So we had to kind of find our own way of doing it. But the, essentially the idea was to immerse the audience to, to, um, so that they become part of the world that, that, that the dance is in, that the story is in, and thereby reaching into their hearts further. Really. And that, that includes using the sub bass and the bass systems. Um, it's quite a big show, it's quite a loud score, so it needs a, loud, a very large loud speaker system with a lot of headroom, uh, which may, means that it feels very powerful. But this particular score, when you listen to it, um, I mean, most of, all, most of his scores are, are grand, but this particular one is almost, it, it has a really modern edge to it, which when you listen to it, you kind of feel like you're in a cinema, basically. The set, then, then we looked, I looked at Les's set and that gave me lots of cues and it felt like we're, it, it was all about worlds and outside worlds and big worlds and what was going on beyond those worlds. And so it's, it's an immersive production and that's why we decided to do it in the surround. That has lots of consequences because obviously that's quite a technical exercise but um, because it means you have to put lots of loud speakers everywhere rather than just putting two speakers on the proscenium. Um, but we stuck with it and, it and it seems to have worked very well. So the biggest challenge of Prokofiev's score, this particular Prokofiev's score, all of them, but this one in particular, which is why again we treated, we treated it very much like a cinematic score, is that it's very dynamic. By that I mean there are very quiet bits and there are very loud bits. So, um, uh, and that's a huge challenge technically, because basically you have to have speakers which can cope with that. And also you have to have loudspeakers and systems which, uh, when it's quiet, still give you the kind of presence that you need as a member of the audience at the back of the, back of the auditorium. So that was a huge challenge. Um, if you, the more I listen to it, actually, the more amazed I am as the, uh, at the kind of colors he uses. It's quite astonishing, actually. Um, and if you compare it to modern, modern composers, he really was a leader in using colors and, and textures and layers of instrumentation. I mean, it, it, it doesn't stop, really. You listen to it again and again and again, and then you go, that's something I've never heard before. And, he, and not only does he 
never use it again, but he only used it for a very short period, whereas many composers would kind of go, oh, that's good, I'll use that again and again and again. He used it for what, like 16 bars and then nothing, nothing at all. And then he goes very quiet, so there's just a few strings. And then, of course, there are the very loud explosive bits, which we use um, for the war setting, <clears throat> and they work very well. Again, it screams cinema to you when you listen to it. That's the, that's the big thing about this score. Challenges not really other than technical challenges, and you have to put a very large system in to be able to cope with that. Um, but, but no, it's just a good thing, I think. My relationship with Matthew has always been very organic in that um, we, Matthew will, say to, will, will tell me very simple things. He will say, for instance, um, it, it, his notes are usually about uh, reaching reaching out and reaching the audience. So he, he will tell me that doesn't quite reach me or that doesn't quite hit me or it doesn't quite, it doesn't quite touch me. It, 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 he rarely goes into detail about how I need to achieve that. He kind of lets me get on with that. And because we've been working together for a long time, um, Matthew, I met Matthew when we worked on Oliver in the Palladium about 25 years ago. So I, I, I know him very well, there's a lot of trust. So I don't, he doesn't, I mean, he can tell me what he wants, but he doesn't necessarily tell me any details about what, what he wants to do. He just tells me what he wants to achieve. And I think that's part of the, I think that's part of the ethos of the, the whole company, actually. Nobody really tells each other what device to use. It's much more about what emotion we're trying to hit and what, what, what um, level of emotion we're trying to hit and when and how the journey goes. So how I do that, he lets me get on with it. And then um, it's very much a case of if he likes it, he'll, he'll, he, that's the last thing I'll hear of it. And, uh, and then if he doesn't like it, he'll tell me. It's one of those situations. And out of that grows something which becomes a, a, a style and a technique and it works very well. But it's not the director telling me to use a certain sound effect at a specific point. It's not like that. That's not the way it works. My inspiration, oddly, are not sound designers. They are people who come generally from the music world who are make very theatrical music. So, uh, the composer of this, which is, which is, which is a very theatrical approach. It's, it's dynamic, it's grand, it, it, there's statements, it's, you know, it's scary, not scary, emotional, stirring, you know, those are the things I love. People like Sir George Martin, who worked with the Beatles, did all the Beatles production. He was a very theatrical composer, he, a very theatrical producer. He was very much a technician like me, but he used his technical, technical abilities in a, 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 through the music device. Um, and so which, if you listen to his music and his productions, there's often sound effects going on in the background. He uses instruments in an unusual way. I love all that kind of stuff. That's, those are the people that inspire me. Not really other sound designers, although I have a lot of respect for them, but they do the same as I do in a different way. I tend to look in different directions for, for inspiration um, for what I want to do. And Sir George Martin is my hero, really. He's, he's I mean, uh, if, if, I, if I'd ever wished I'd met him, he would, he would have been, it would have been my big day, really. Yeah.